All right, I think we can get started. Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Parish Art Museum. My name is Corinne Ernie. I'm the chief curator, and it gives me great pleasure to be speaking with uh, two distinct artists uh, who are in the current exhibition. And that's my th to my right, and happy birthday, Ned. <laughs> can we reveal that? Yes. <laughs> oh, no. Um, and John Torriano. And um, so both Ned and John are in the current exhibition, Artists Choose Parish. And as you will notice, this is um, only the second time that we have the entire museum uh, filled with one exhibition. And um, so uh, the task was we invited 41 artists of this area, but that are also internationally renowned, to choose works from our collection. And uh, our collection holds 3,600 works, so that's quite a feat. Um, and the artists went through the works online at first, and then they came to the museum because we have most of the works right here in, in a vault, and looked through them and chose the works that they wanted to show, and then also the works that of their own that they wanted to show. So um, tonight, um, I will first um, invite them to talk about their practice. You will see um, some slides. Um, that's about 10 minutes each, and then we will have a conversation. And um, I would like to thank the Corcoran Group for uh, supporting the Friday night programs. So thank you. All right, Ned. Oh, I'm supposed to start. You are. No intro. There was. Is intro. this? Yes, it is. Um, so the, the piece outside um, came after uh, spending a summer um, building a house in Aspen, Colorado, right after I graduated college, for a friend of mine who was four years older, and he just graduated from Yale Architecture School, and he asked me to come out to help him build. And I told him right off the bat, I didn't, I, I don't know how to build. He said, "Don't worry, we'll teach you." Anyway, I spent the summer cutting two by four, camping out on Red Mountain, which is right across from the ski hill. And um, so when I came back, I thought, oh, I'm going to cast concrete two by fours. I think I've said this to a few people, but, um, and it came because of um, Frank Stella black paintings, where there was black and then there'd be a bit of linen in between. And so there were these stripes. And I thought they were really elegant. And I'd been kind of uh, met minimalist artists when I first got to New York and help them make their pieces. Um, so when I started doing the two by fours, at first I had them just against the wall, but then I started to make different constructions with them um, that, um, and, and it's, it's interesting. Um, the first person who ever saw this work was Leo Castelli, came to my studio, which not so bad. And um, he, you know, was really nice. And then I had Klaus Curtis come to visit. And Klaus saw this piece on the right, and he said, do you know um, Richard Serra? And I didn't really at that time. But Richard had pieces of lead propped up. He would roll up a piece of lead, and it would keep it up against the wall. He said, this is like a lot Richard Serra. And as soon as I heard that, I stopped doing this work. <laughs> Why am I going backwards? I don't know. Even though I'm pushing the right way. Sometimes you have to push the right way. Interesting. Yeah, you're right. There you go. Yeah. Click to the left. Click to the left now. Anyway, so. As I started to do the two by fours and I would see them, it reminded me of kind of early Renaissance architecture in paintings in the backgrounds. And my dad was a Renaissance scholar and so I um, was dragged from every church and every Greek temple and every Roman site with mosaics. Um, but as I began to look at the the concrete two by fours, it reminded me of architecture and I began to cast um, arches and entranceways to allude to interiors and to express exteriors. 
This is, the, this is the piece. This was shown at 112 Green Street in New York. Um, Gordon Mata Clark, who I cut all his pieces uh, back in the day. I met him um, cooking at food restaurant that he had started. And um, he came and saw this work. And he was supposed to show at this gallery called 112 Green Street. And he said, Ned, I really like your work. And I don't really have anything to show. Why don't you show? So this was in uh, 112 Green Street space, which is an enormous uh, in space. The doors were never locked. Anyone could walk in, walk out. There was no one sitting there. But it was in the early days of Soho when that was really possible. Um, I worked uh, with um, Jean Heistein, who was married to um, Alana Heiss. And Alana Heiss started PS1. And she had seen works of mine, and I'd been helping Jean install pieces. And she said, Ned, I want you to come out and, and you know, for the first show at, at uh, PS1, uh, you know, it's a, we're inviting people, na national artists from around the country. So come out and look at it. And I went out, and I just kind of went, I hate school. It had blackboards, fluorescent, it was a school. And I just said, Alana, I can't work in this environment. This is not what I do. And she said, well, go in the basement and go in the attic. And I went to the attic, and there was this incredible space with arched windows that had sun coming in. And when I looked at it, I went, oh, Last Supper. And so I cast this enormous concrete table and plates and, and things like that. And she got so much attention traveling around um, Europe the next summer for it, she was the one who gave me my first commission, uh, who, which had gone to um, Noguchi, and he had turned it down because it was nowhere near enough money for him. And so she put my name up, and that's what I got. This was after that, I started doing columns uh, and basically reverent spaces. So this was as you walked in, this was the interior. I was also really interested in Jung and the idea of the circle as the, the individual or the whole. Um, so I started to do these kind of birdbath shapes um, as, as a kind of idea of the individual. Um, Dennis Oppenheim, who John chose, came into my show, the last show, and the next morning, uh, that was with Holly Solomon Gallery, and the next morning I went in to talk to Holly, and she said, you know, Dennis Oppenheim asked if you were Catholic. And I went, what? And um, I said, no, but he thought that this last, this space was a Catholic religious space. And I thought of it as a reverent space, um, not necessarily a particular religion. So the next thing I thought is, oh, I got to do a space that doesn't deal with that. What's an early reverent space? And uh, what came up was the garden. So I did a garden with an artist friend of mine, Brad Davis. And um, I cast these forms and cut out these screens and, whoop, I don't know what that is. Oh, we're missing a piece. Anyway, um, he did these paintings that fit into my concrete arches and things like that. And um, all the images that we chose in it were taken really from kind of Jungian symbolism. So this was a piece I did afterwards. Uh, at Holly, I was immediately thought of as a pattern and decoration artist. And I went, no, I'm a minimal artist. I come out of minimalism. And, but meeting artists there, like um, Brad Davis, like Kim McConnell in California, like Tommy Lanigan Schmidt, who um, was making you know, religious icons out of transparent colored tissue paper. Um, Anyway, I, it, it, it kind of allowed me to move towards 
what I called kind of cathedralism, which was when you walked into a when I walked in as a kid, you know, it would be really hot outside and um, it would be super sunny. And you'd come in and you, it would be cool and you, your eyes took a while to adjust. And when they did, you were aware of these enormous columns and, and stained glass window light coming in and paintings and sculpture and mosaic. And um, that idea, I thought, well, that's cool. So I started printing fabric, making mosaics, doing sculpted work, uh, and made these total environments. Um, that, and it wasn't about an object per se, it was about the feeling from the whole space. This was a piece I did after. Um, this was Temptation Judgment, and I had wanted to be start to do mosaic and, and terrazzo floors, so I started doing these. Um, I did photographs, I did really realistic drawings, and then turned them into Mo uh, mosaics and ground them so they were smooth. This was in that same show. Um, this was a series of 3D figurative work. When I was in the uh, the Venice Biennale in in, in, in 1980, uh, the person next to me was Clemente, and he was. It was a kind of no one was doing figurative work that I knew in New York back before the 80s. And, um, but it kind of enabled me to go, oh, so I'm going to begin to use fig figurative. And these were concrete uh, columns. Um, the last show I did with Holly was called Male Interiors. And the idea of this is, um, was that men, most men, and certainly me at the time, you know, the, Jung said that, that everybody has a, a male side and a female side. And, um, and I, I found that really fascinating. But for a lot of men, it's kind of hard to connect with your female side. Uh, you want to, and, and, but sometimes it's kind of enticing. Sometimes it's scary. Um, so this series, was done uh, from that. And they were uh, mosaic. They were about um, eight feet tall by, t by 12 feet wide. This was the first commission I did uh, in St. Thomas. Um, it, I had done the, um, the garden show. And um, so when I was asked to do this piece, I went down and it was a courtyard, two-story courtyard that you could look down uh, from the top. And so I, I had always loved um, pulpits, these big pulpits in Catholic churches uh, that with, a, with a stair going up. And they just seemed really interesting. So that in center box came from that. And water kind of went up into it and then dribbled down into the fountain. Um, and uh, you could see. Uh, water lilies in the top when you were up on the upper level looking down. This was a uh, piece I did in um, Pittsburgh, and they asked me to come. Would you do something uh, about um, labor? And I went, OK. And um, But again, it was on the bank across from downtown. And a lot of temples, or it, when I would see them in Sicily, were up on a hill looking down where the town was and where they would go out and fish. So I thought I would make this, um, these architectural forms that you look through at the city across, across the way. Um, I don't have interiors of this, but these over here had or had men and women building, and on the up, on this side was men and women, uh, kind of the pain of, of labor and the abuse. This was Battery Park City, first piece that was done in Battery Park City. I was asked to come in, and a bunch of people were asked to make presentations, um, and um, 
the engineers and everyone there chose me to be the first. Um, Stella was there. I mean, there were a lot of major people. But um, the engineers thought, well, this doesn't look like a sculpture. So this could be popular right off the bat. <laughs> But what I really liked about this piece, I would go down every so often, and a, a woman who lived right next to it came out, and I was standing, and she walked up and she says, this is awful. And, and I went, really? And she, I said, why? She said, the Hell's Angels, who were on a third street in the East Village, come here every Saturday and hang out and play music. And I went, really? That's so cool. <laughs> this is a big, uh, enormous kind of mosaic uh, that was done in, for a, a company in um, Bethesda, Maryland. When uh, I moved into a studio on Shelter Island, I had built a big studio with big uh, storage place. And I moved all this storage, you know, art, uh, particularly sculptors, have so much stuff in storage. And, but I had these milk crates with stones in them. And I kind of looked at them. And this one on the right and the one on the left, they look like male and female torsos. And so if I just cut it to stand, um, they work. So I was asked to do a, a, a piece for a university in New Jersey for a new... Um, nursing school. And so I thought, oh, this would work. So I did it, and these were the large, you know, they're over 12 feet tall uh, bronzes that came out of the stones. And for me, it was really nice to move away from kind of history, which is kind of like the pieces out there. Um, and to move into something that I thought of as still reverent, but more Paleolithic. Um, this is one of the stones that I found. And um, I just thought these things were beautiful. So I began to collect stones. And from this piece, um, I did this sculpture, which was 24 tons, for um, a new building that my friend Chris Coy designed in Florida. So this was 24 tons carved out of stone from a 3D model that I took from the stones. And at a certain point, I, I'd be walking looking for stones, and I couldn't find any. But what I, I would, all of a sudden, I would notice something that would wash up on the beach that was a twig. And so I began to collect them. And this piece, um, I mean, was almost like an insect to me. And it's just, it was amazing that that's it, it in bronze. This is it in wood, a piece that I found. I mean, this is almost like winged victory or something like that. What's this, the scale of this, Ned? I'm sorry? What is the scale of this, the size? The actual stone is that tall. Uh, it's not a stone, it's a piece of wood. And I didn't touch it or do anything. Um, it, this is... That's what it looked like. And it just blew me away that you'd find things that kind of washed up on the beach that I wouldn't cut or change or do anything that kind of reminded me of art history or, uh, or just amazing shapes. Now what? Why isn't this going the other way? That's backwards. Oh, there you go. No. And, and this was a piece that I was asked by Eric Firestone to do a show. And he wasn't sure what. And he was away. And he finally came over on a Sunday before I was supposed to open on Friday. And he decided, I'm going to do. I want your mosaics. And so I kind of did, found some mosaics and put them up. Um, and it was, it's kind of interesting because people, when they saw this work, that's another one of those pieces, um, 
they, they kept saying, oh, it's so, it's so now. And that's what kind of people said when they saw the concrete two by fours. And I said, no, that was done in 1972. And these were done in, I think, 86. Um, but so it's been interesting to show old work uh, that seems to connect still. Absolutely. Thank you, Ned. And I'm handing it over to John. Which button? The left. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I thought I would start August 17th, 1941, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I was born. 9 pounds, 11 ounces. And then work every day. From there, <laughs> kidding. But anyway, when I first moved to New York, it was 1968, and there were like four religions, uh, minimalism, uh, abstract expressionism, um, emerging conceptualism, and color field painting. And uh, there, were an awful, there was an awful lot of uh, anti-painting uh, uh, criticism going on uh, Articles being written and so on, and I hate. I I I, I said no, you know, and um, <clears throat> Greenberg uh, promoted this idea that since photography uh, took over the uh, area of reproducing imagery, then painting should only be about painting. There are all these rules. It should be abstract. It should be flat. Uh, it should uh, be about painting. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Did I do that? <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Uh, how do I get back to that one? Uh, I won't go back. How do you get back to that one? Anyway, um, so I... Uh, uh, yes. So uh, I decided, uh, so he had this essentialistic idea. You know, sculpture should only do what sculpture can do. Painting should not have illusionism in it. It should only be about painting. And I was, uh, in my typically uh, contrary way, I said no. Uh, and this was in regards to minimalism, too. There was this less is more concept. And I remember writing down in my sketchbook, less is less, more is more. No more, no less. And so I started to do, do, make paintings that were um, all the different tools that you could use to create illusions of space. And I had studied uh, visual perception from the Gestaltists at Ohio State. That's where I got my degree. And by the way, the same teacher, uh, White Sherman, uh, for me, was also uh, Roy Lichtenstein's teacher. And he gives him a lot of credit for this. Anyway, so uh, there's the dot space in here. I called it chemical space at the time that created the different size dots. Size is a um, uh, cue for depth perception. And thick over thin painting, which is a classic, that's a form of uh, brightness and size uh, creating illusion. So we have, then uh, I used uh, French curves to create these uh, shapes. This painting is called TV Bulge, and I remember completing it the night we landed on the moon. <laughs> and uh, I was into trying to get contradistinctive things. So you can't tell from this old slide, but the, this uh, white here is actually bare canvas. And so you have a reference to the ground in this one with the white dots floating over it. The black dots are a grid, so that's another uh, spatial structure. This painting uh, was uh, selected for the Whitney Annual, <laughs> 1969. So they had annuals in those days. Anyway, so now we can go. So the same thing here. This is a raw canvas. That's painted to match the raw canvas. Oh, what happened? I did that again? Ah, okay. So the white dots are be, are overlapped by the painted uh, shape and underneath the black one, but they float out over the, um, the canvas one. And I had made giant French curves uh, out of uh, masonite in order to make these bulging shapes. Um, <clears throat> 
black bar. So you can see the same thing, a different torque on this end. What the hell? Sorry for my language. We're in a public space, John. Anyway, uh, so black bar, well, the black bar is the most crisp, was the square, so that's the most close shape, and then a thicker shape, and then wash shapes behind that, again, with the dots. At this point, um, uh, this is a painting I did. It's 20 feet long and six feet high, and I was in the most, there's somebody, am I going too slow? No. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so these, uh, uh, I was in a severe, severe uh, depressive state at the time, sleeping 18 hours a day and waking up with this uh, horrible uh, self-diminutive value. But I managed to crawl out into my studio and make this painting. And one day, and I like to point that out for when I was teaching the students, that how you feel doesn't necessarily relate to your work. You can, you can feel horrible and make a good painting, and you can feel great and make a bad painting. And there's something positive about that, because uh, if you're in a bad state and you can manage to do something, guess what? How you act determines how you feel as much as the other way around. So if you act like you're feeling better, you'll start to feel better. Anyway, sorry for the little psychoanalytic thing there. Um, so this was the first, uh, one of the first paintings I did when I was, began to, work. there's many years here. <laughs> I did it again. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, I had uh, wanted to become more articulate with the distribution of the dots. And uh, because if you just do them out of your mind, you'll do cliched distributions. So I said, where are there dots in nature? Oh, stars. <laughs> so I started to look at stars. And my dot distribution got much better, but I also started to read about the stars from the books that I was using. And I completely connected to the um, concept of the Big Bang theory, as well as the concept of curvature in space. And all the things I was reading aligned for me with my idea about painting much better than Greenberg or any contemporary uh, criticism did. So this is an effort to create a bulging shape. This is giant quarter round. And uh, so you have the physicality of the painting and the illusions of the stars or the dots becoming functional as a way of creating an illusionistic space. So right there is the theme that has permeated my artwork uh, since the beginning, even the earlier ones, which I mentioned earlier when we were talking out there with Dennis's piece, the idea of contradictive things, physical and visual, the physical materiality of something and then the illusion that you create with it as a way of suspending uh, one's sense of where they are in their thinking and also in their perception. And that's something I've always liked about the big thing. Okay, now it doesn't want to go. There you go. <laughs> This was a, a painting I made back in, uh, I had to be, oh, sorry, in the 70s, and it was a trade at Magoo's for a, a bar tab. <laughs> but it's a good painting. It's in Japan now somewhere. Anyway. They sold the whole art thing, and it's a Japanese uh, company actually re, apparently, this is a story, Remade Magoo's as an exhibition type invite. Magoo's was a great bar. Yeah. In Tribeca. Yeah. Where you could get art to drink. And eat. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, wait, wrong way. Okay. Later in the 70s, I uh, started to explore the actual imagery that I was really. Did I do it again? That I was really responding to in, in these books. And um, uh, so I started to do a more pointillistic uh, process with the gems. You can't tell, but there's lots of gems in there as well as painted dots. And uh, <clears throat> the idea was that these were equivalents for me to molecules. And uh, you know, at a certain distance, you can see the configuration uh, of uh, 
an outer space object, but as you get closer, then it would dissipate because uh, the distance between the molecules would expand. And so this one is really big. It's in the Dayton Museum uh, of Art, and it's uh, called uh, Exploding Galaxy. Uh, okay, and the Crab Nebula. Now, I'm, I'm putting these in here in part to describe this. <laughs> to do, I'm going to stay there. Uh, to describe this uh, process that, uh, in hindsight, I seem to have gone through, where I will discover something, explore that for a while, and then go on and on, and then find myself in, an, in another iteration of those ideas, and not remembering that I had done this before. And uh, I'm going to explain that now because of the work I'm doing right now has a lot to do with these that were done in the late 70s. Um, okay, I did a whole series of works about, remember there was a documentary called The Sky Above and the Mud Below in Africa, and uh, I loved, sometimes a title, God, what the hell is going on here? Stay still. Uh, so uh, sometimes a title will inspire a painting for me. And uh, I've got uh, one towards the end of this. And the sky above and the mud below, I love that. So I started doing above and below, the sky above and the sky below, all different kinds of those, and, uh, and then the split between. So uh, you have this kind of uh, stellar space. These are gems, by the way, you can't tell. And then this kind of physical uh, space up above, they're not supposed to work together. And it's supposed to be loose and distant here and physical there. Um, later, <laughs> a series of a very, uh, you know, I painted with um, a circular saw. I painted with a circular saw and drills, in effect, and a router to make these marks to create this uh, uh, Blue shrapnel. There's a painting in the collection here called PM's Mom that has been shown. Uh, and the PM refers to Piet Mondrian. And it was uh, my way of honoring Mondrian, who for a while there in the 40s would make these beautiful, small, realistic paintings of mums and other still lifes. And you could get them for like five bucks or what have you which I wished I had that opportunity. It would be great to have a PM's mom. This is the painting that's in this exhibition. And for I was describing, I was describing earlier that uh, it's a good example of the theme, uh, this theme of contradistinction of simultaneous uh, contradicting uh, character so it's a very physical painting made out of plywood and uh, with uh, carved with a router, these ovals, and then wood balls that are various colors. So uh, on the one hand, if you gaze at it, you will see just you'll be aware of all this physicalness. And then as you gaze, there will be this illusion of a disbursement of, these, uh, of the imagery of the ovals and the balls. It won't necessarily happen in the slide. <laughs> but that kind of contradistinction is a, a theme uh, that I've discovered I've been involved with all my life. <laughs> ovals and balls. This one shows uh, that idea really well, I think. Where you have plywood, but you know, uh, damn. You have plywood, but you also have old, big giant ovals and balls and gems that sparkle, and they compete with each other. But in a sense, that causes you to be arrested from trying to get an anchor to some kind of particular meaning. And my feeling has always been that, um, in some sense, art is against meaning. <laughs> talk about that later. <laughs> okay, now let's go. Ah, there. This is me uh, being inspired by our galaxy. And, and uh, the other um, title for this is, um, what is the other title? It's a funny title. Well, anyway. I'm going to keep going. 
go on here. Uh, you may have seen the exhibition uh, that was here of a lot of these big paintings. I went uh, through a period of actually focusing in on a lot of the imagery <clears throat> of outer space coming from the, um, uh, the er earlier telescope, not the new one. And uh, so this is a very big painting, and there are stump balls in there. This is a, both of these are objects that if you look at an astronomy book, you'll, you'll, you'll see all three of these. So my, my resources of outer space image uh, re, I started to explore that a lot. <clears throat> and because the imagery itself has these contradictive characteristics to them. This is a birth, birthing area, like almost the vagina of outer space, you could say. Um, this to me is one of my most successful ones. <laughs> This is very delicate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is at the edge of Orion. Orion, and these. Um, I'm using all the tools I had. This took me five years to do this because I would think it was done for a year, then I would know it wasn't done, then I would think it was done. Another year goes by. Finally, I completed it. But it has all the tools that I had been using: routed out uh, grooves, uh, holes, uh, gems, balls, sprays, everything. Uh, I did uh, a lot of the completely abstract works uh, are images of uh, what, are, uh, inside images of of the nebulosities that I was exploring. UDF stands for ultra deep field. Whoops. Hot stars and galaxy. Hot stars are the blue stars. The blue stars uh, are the most uh, hot, and the red stars are the most cold. Like uh, if you heat up a bar of steel, it would get deep red, then redder, then redder, then it would be white hot. In outer space, it would be blue hot. That's what I was told anyway. For a while, I taught at uh, in New Mexico State University as an artist in resident. And uh, a, a guy named Clyde Tombo was there. He was the part of their astronomy department. Clyde Tombo is the guy that discovered um, uh, uh, pardon? Pluto. Pluto, yes. Thank you. <laughs> and the way they did it in those days is they counted stars. And if anything moved uh, after hours and hours of counting, that would be a planet. That's how hard it was to find something. He was a little crunched over guy, and he liked punning all the time. I liked him a lot. But when I saw pictures of him on the Gary Moore show when he first discovered Pluto, uh, he was a tall, kind of muscular guy. But So in those days, it would be like this. So the job kind of, you know, sorry I got off on a tangent there. <laughs> Anyway, this is the Whirlpool Galaxy um, inspiration. So uh, I use the imagery to make the paintings. I'm not using the imagery for the imagery's sake. Uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to push painting for myself, and the imagery and the concepts around outer space help me do it. Oh, my. Doesn't want to go. Boom, boom. There we go. And now we're down to the end. Uh, this is a whirlpool galaxy that just went everywhere. Cosmic breath, one of my favorite little paintings. And uh, this is a recent painting that was in exhibition recently <clears throat> at the drawing room gallery. <laughs> at the drawing room gallery. Uh, the veil, the veil ref references the veil nebula, and uh, wait, what? I won't go backwards sometimes. I see. I can only go backwards. Okay, backwards, backwards, frontwards. I won't go frontwards now. Ah, there, now it's going. Wait. Okay, boom, boom, boom. Okay, and this is a painting I did last summer in Italy. 
Cosmic Snow, and uh, it's uh, and this one is called Cosmic Angel. Let me go back to Cosmic Snow a little bit. So these bulge out. This is an example of me returning to a tool I used in uh, the in the first outer in the first Big Bang paintings that you saw with the frames. I returned to it here, and uh, whoops, sorry. Um, Cosmic Angel, a lot of the titles that they have for the objects in outer space uh, have these very kind of mystical uh, character to them. So these are scientists that are inspired with words and concepts that are poetic by the nature of, it, by the nature of their selection of uh, titles. And that's why I liked that one. And Cosmic Snow. Sparkle from Veil. Oh, oh, I'm going backwards. God, I'm sorry, you guys. Okay. I had to do this. So, and this is another example of a painting inspired by uh, a title. Uh, Barbie's Blood. <laughs> Damn it. Barbie's Blood after seeing the, the movie. And I thought, you know, she's talking about fallen arches as a, met I think, metaphor for having menstruation for the first time. <laughs> so that's why I came up with the title Barbie's Blood. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is the last slide of an installation of the ghost gems, which uh, are part of the collection here. Whoops, I did it again. And, uh, <clears throat> did I? Was I too fast, slow? That was great. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Amazing presentation. Thank you. So, um, but I noticed in both of you is your love and passion for material um, and diving into um, sort of unexplored spaces. I think you're looking at the psyche, you're looking at young, um, you're looking at the cosmos. Um, so I, I see some... Um, connections there and also I mean you you're calling yourself a painter but there's a there's definitely a sculptural aspect and um, and you I would say is primarily a sculptor but you're also a photographer and I just wanted to know if um, mosaics and a lot of realistic yeah figure it, yeah but still sculpture yeah it's yeah rough. yeah okay um, but I just wanted to sort of hear a bit more how or what inspired you to to go that down that path that you're that you're going, um, you know, to work in this uh, in the material in the form that you work in? Uh, one day I was walking down the street on Canal Street back in the early '70s, <clears throat> and in those days it was like a, a you know, a big uh, uh, bazaar, really, of objects. Pardon? Yeah, big hardware, but they had everything there. Out on the street. Yeah, right out on the street. You get different kinds of rubber here. You could get uh, different kinds of things there. And there was a table uh, full of these glass gems. And at that time, I had never uh, used any gems. Uh, I had been doing dots, as you saw, and the dots got buried in the paint. And uh, what I was responding to was how, if you... Uh, looked at the painting this way, you saw 10 dots, this way you saw two dots. And uh, I like the uh, interaction between the viewer and the, uh, the, the location of the viewer determine, determining specifically what they were seeing. So that re reinforced the particularity of the viewer uh, and that the meaning is created by the viewer, not by the artist. And so when I saw these gems, Bam, they really did it, like that, boom, boom. I thought, wow. So uh, I got a bunch of those, and I did a series of plaques uh, called, um, that, I, that, that uh, explored that idea. I forgot what this started with, but what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> How you got inspired, I mean, what inspired oh, okay. you to? Okay, so yeah. right off the bat, uh, I, I, I started to, uh, I, I wasn't involved with outer space or anything, I was just involved with this idea of seeing some dots, sometime and on the way to the bathroom at two in the morning, you'd see five, 
Next time you'd see only two. So the way it reinforced like a, a you know, an exclamation point of your activity and your presence, right? And the gems, they really did it. And so I started doing that. And then what happened was I found that my distributions of dots and gems were kind of like do 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 not very interesting. So I thought, where in, in nature are there dots? So I thought, sky, stars, perfect. So I started using images, photos of stars, and to help me make more articulate distributions of the dots. And then I started reading <laughs> the books that I was responding to about the concepts of space, like uh, the nature of curvature, for example, that space actually curves. And then I thought, you know what, these ideas about space um, are, make more sense to me than the Greenbergian ideas about space or any art criticism idea about space. So I started to follow that idea. So a lot of the contradistinctions that go on in the work, uh, like the physical in contrast to the illusional, um, or the sensual in contrast to the, uh, you know, like flatness of the hardware, all of those ideas had a lot to do with that process. I mean, it's interesting, as you, you say, you kind of went against the idea of Greenberg, and, and was it hard at the time? Because obviously, you know, he had his followers and, and a lot of influence and power, and um, how, you know, how easy was it to go against that and, and be well, successful? At that time, I moved to New York in 68. There were, like I said earlier, four religions, yes. and the idea of the avant-garde was still going on, that each, each new generation was going to counteract to the mm -hmm. previous generation. And so ideas about uh, art were very rigid, you know, and defined. And the minimalists, uh, blew, the minimalists, when they emerged, they were like a reaction to the abstract expressionist mm -hmm. in a sense. You know, if you, if you just have sound, 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 splash, 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 and all of a sudden quiet, that stimulates you because it's the difference out of the mass, mm -hmm. and vice versa, right? So minimalism, it was like, wow, you know? I love that. Right. And um, <clears throat> so uh, I was, uh, I explored everything, and I, I, I was eclectic. Right. So I did minimalist things, and I did abstract expressionist things, and I did even uh, elements of pop art imagery. I could have shown some of those, but there were, I didn't want to do too many. And um, Ned, I wanted to um, also ask you uh, the same question. I mean, you you talked about minimalism, and um, the work that you're showing here is definitely minimalist. And um, you evolved and did other type of works as well. And uh, but you you also said that this work feels very, or somebody said it feels very relevant. And and I agree with that. And why do you think it still feels relevant, 50 years later? Good question. I don't, I mean, I think it looked, seeing it out there, it looked great. Um, someone was saying to me earlier that isn't minimalism coming back now? I don't know. I haven't seen much of it um, myself because when you go to galleries, a lot of it's kind of cartoon work and all sorts of stuff. Um, so I, I don't know so much about minimal, but it looked fresh to me. And people said, are you going to make more of these? And, you know, I'm really working in a whole with, with these stone pieces and twig pieces and doing photographs and really enormous um, castings from them. But um, I don't know. Recently, I had a dream the other night that... Um, had mosaic mm -hmm. in it, and but it was on a stone, and then there was this mosaic inlaid into the stone, and I thought, well, that's so weird. What is that from? And but it's made me begin to think about um, bringing old and new together again. Right. Absolutely, and um, I also want to ask you both about your choices for artists whose parish. Um, you mentioned that you were looking for minimalist art in the collection, couldn't find it. <laughs> and uh, But then you saw the Louise Nevelson. Um, and can you talk a little bit about that 
um, well, choice. Well, Louise, I, would, I knew her work back in the 70s. And um, my first loft was over on Delancey Street. And <clears throat> walking across Little Italy, I walked past her where she lived yeah. regularly. So it was kind of in my, I was aware of her. Um, and um, so when, you know, when I saw that she was in the collection and, you know, it was defined as eight feet tall, which are what the two by fours are, but the two by fours are kind of a little on an angle, so that shortens them a bit. Um, I thought, you know, that it, there's a grain, there is a connection between the two, and um, the the mono color of the black is different than gray or a, a, a Sarah piece of steel or whatever or a Judd plywood, but um, it it seemed to work fine and be in proportion with the, the work I was going to show. And maybe also the, the, the material, the, the type of material. I mean, yours is concrete and hers is wood. Uh, so it's also the simplicity of material that, well, you, that you both chose. Mine refers to wood. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Two by fours. Yeah. Absolutely. But. Yeah. And um, so, John, your, your choice of um, Dennis Oppenheim's Splash Building, which is one of the later works, uh, which he did just two years before he died. Um, <clears throat> he, he and I live on the same street in New York and have studio, studios, and I knew him, and he was also a friend, a common friend with our friend Dale Chihuly, the glass artist. And in fact, we were both artists in residence at the Pilchuck Glass School at one time together. And I like the idea of the way the, uh, you know, if you think of the chessboard, there's only one uh, move on the board that's unique in the sense that it's not linear, and that's the knight, right? Two up and one over, two up and two over. And I, uh, I look for those, con I call them contradistinctions. And um, I saw that in his work in reference to my work as an opportunity to explore how that might work out, you know. But it turns out it's not that contradistinctive, in a way, with the, with the balls and... The spheres and, that he's using. Yeah, right? but he was very theatrical in a lot of his ideas. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and I was theatrical in a theatrical idea, but not in the art idea. And I like the idea of it being very... Con very contrasting, but in the sense it really isn't, because mm -hmm. uh, the materials that he uses in those. And I, I think he was influenced by his experience at, at uh, Pilchuck right. with glass. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Um, when we talked about this conversation, you both um, mentioned um, that you wanted to talk a little bit about a certain moment in time um, when you were both downtown New York City, and it was sort of a moment, right, for, um, for artists in Soho and so forth. And do you want to converse a bit about those times and how, also how you know each other, how you, Well, you know, I think you got here before I did. So you, what did you say, 68? I'm a lot older than you. <laughs> really? <laughs> and, um, and I got there, I think, eventually in 71. Were you downtown below Canal first, or were you? No, I was on Delancey Street first, oh, okay. and then I got a guy broke in, stole all my stuff, and I said, you know, and I found out who it was. He lived in the next building. His father was a cop, and he, I said, if you bring back everything, I won't press charges, and he didn't. So I pressed charges, and he had. 10 sheets of arrests, wow. and they just let him go. You think he had a problem with his father? <laughs> <laughs> like all of us? No. Um, he, yeah. he um, and, but the one thing that the, the, the judge said is, you know, I'm gonna let you go, but if you do come back and, and intimidate him or do anything, then you're gonna, you know, you can, we'll, we might put you away. 
And I was out building this house, and I rented the space to a friend of mine who was uh, getting his law degree. And um, when I got back, he said, the guy came back with a bunch of guys looking for you. So I went, I'm out of here. And that's when I got a place in Washington Market, which became Tribeca. Yeah. I moved down to, from my um, spring, uh, my uh, Green Street space because the landlord wanted to up the rent from $175 a month to $300 a month. Can you That's believe crazy. it? <laughs> so I went down town and got one for $200 a month before it was called. Uh, I, I moved to um, Soho before it was called Soho, and I moved to Tribeca before it was called Tribeca. Yeah, when I moved, met, it was... We wa sort of met there around... It was Boston. Washington Market when I moved, and my street was all, they were all, and my building had been, cold storage. So there was about this much insulation covering the windows and everything, and they, there were trucks all along my block. No one lived there, um, delivering cheese and vegetables and things like that. <clears throat> and um, What year was that? Uh, about? I moved there in 74. So two years after I did, yeah. And, and literally there was almost nothing there. Yeah. To buy food you had to go up into the village to a supermarket. Um, there was nothing down there. The, the only thing, there was a, there was, do you remember there was a diner on West Broadway um, that you could go in and the people owned the whole building and they sold it, the building, and that's where Odeon opened up. Right. I, I used to go to the Odeon before it was the Odeon, and the windows were where the bar is. Yeah. And you would take a, tic, a ticket and go a And you'd get food out of these yeah. little things. Would and then there was, with, We'd have breakfast there. And then there was a, a block yeah. south of that yeah. um, was a Greek restaurant. Yeah. Which also was, was really good. And cheap, which anyway, was nice. We're do, being too nostalgic, maybe. So that was obviously, yeah, I can hear the nostalgia. That was obviously fertile ground for, for artists, yes. uh, you know, to have cheap um, spaces, spaces and, and to do the work. Um, so, but you both decided to move out here. What, what prompted you to move to this area? And, and how do you see that sort of, do you see, or do you see that kind of like artist community replicated here? Um, oh. I, I, um, when did you move here? I, I uh, was the first visual artist at the Edward Albee Foundation in like 1969, 70. Okay. In Montauk. They, yeah, yeah, and they, they had a whole space that had never been used, and the dormitories were there and so on. And a friend of mine uh, named Patrick Kenny was running the place for Edward. And he said, why don't you have an artist, a visual artist, come and be there? And he recommended me. And so I didn't know anything about uh, Long Island between Manhattan and Montauk. <laughs> but I loved Montauk. And so that was my introduction to the East End. And uh, I kept, every time I would get a little bit of money to buy a loft, it wasn't, you know, at first you could get them for 5000 When I got the 5000 then they were 10000 and so on, right? So finally I got a, a combination of... Uh, things, grants and sales in the um, 80s, late 80s, and I decided, well, I, if I don't spend this somehow, I'm going to end up without any money or a, a space. And a friends of mine had spaces out here, and uh, I thought, uh, Sag Harbor, oh. and so that's how I got here. Right, right, right. Yeah. And Did the you... community, I like, what I like about uh, the community is that it has a, a similar um, scale as when I first moved to New York. Uh, you, you see artists, you know them, you know. It's not so, now it's just so huge in the city that you're, you're lost. I mean, I'm in, I'm, in I'm, I'm still in my same spot and there's thousands of new galleries all around me and they haven't got a clue and I don't have a clue. Right. <laughs> so my attitude was I had friends that would say, 
you know, they would be renting out here in the summer. And they said, Ned, you got to come out. Come on out. And I go, you know, I'm not going out there. I don't wear pink pants and play golf. <laughs> and it was a projection of a kind of really preppy uh, place. And at a certain point, um, my, uh, my older son had met a kid in, in the park in Tribeca and they rented a place out here and they said, they were Australian, and they said, um, why don't you come out and visit? I said, no way, I'm not going out there. And I was, it, it was kind of stupid. Um, and he looked at me and he said, Ned, this is for the kids. They're going to have a great time. Just come out. So I came out and went down to Gibson Beach, and I walked out on the beach, and there was all the artists I knew from New York. Yeah. And I went, oh, I get it. Yeah, I, I uh, realized uh, not too long ago that I've always lived on peninsulas or islands, because I was brought up in Michigan, and uh, my father and his family came from the Upper Peninsula. So the Upper Peninsula, the Lower Peninsula, Manhattan, Long Island, and my uh, this, the country that I visit the most is Italy. Italy. So I've got something you to ha do. You have with that connection. <laughs> Peninsula. Italy. You grew yeah. up in Italy. Yeah. 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 And um, I'm just one last question that I'm asking, and then I want I want to open it up to the to the audience. How do you stay relevant? It it just kind of hit me when I saw your Barbie's blood uh, work. <laughs> <laughs> it's like so okay, so you go see Barbie's film and you create work. Um, so, I mean, that's obviously just a metaphor, but how, how do you stay relevant as an artist? I think uh, by, in a, in a way, by being irre irrelevant, by, by not being involved with relevancy. Like, uh, you, you just, my journey has been, uh, you know, I, <clears throat> there are many, I feel like I'm the longest emerging artist of all time. Like, Kilroy was here. I keep coming up, you know. Never made him slamming at home. But I realized in my old age that I did that on purpose. I, because I come from a working area in Flint, Michigan, and I knew uh, in those days uh, when you were inspired by abstract expressionism the way I was and so on, it was very connected to the beatnik. Beatniks and money was the uh, was to be avoided. Enemy. It was the enemy yeah. of art, and I had that philosophy, and that's the thing I still have to a certain extent. At some level, I know that if I had gotten caught up in how much can I get for this one versus that one too much, uh, then it, I would start be replicating things that I you, you knew I could sell. I, you can't sell these because they don't want those, so you'll make more of these. So then you're out of the, you're out of your journey in a sense. Yeah, that's what happens a lot. I mean, I guess it's a fine line because you want to be able to live as an artist, but you also want to stay true to yourself. Well, the money, the money and art is kind of like the two by four you use to wake up the jackass. You know, it's like you could be making really good art, but if it's not in a place where it'll be seen, it doesn't matter. So you hit up, you, you have to make some money in order for people to start paying attention to it. That's right. Yeah. But, I, I, you know, on another level, um, I think my work started totally intuitively. Because when I started making anything, well, in college, I was, I was a dyslexic. It was really hard for me to write papers and stuff, or even read for a long time. And so I, in college, and I was, a, I, growing up in Italy, I had learned to play soccer, and in high school and college, I was captains of all the teams and high score Midwest and all this kind of stuff. And I just thought, I want to. I don't want to take a philosophy course or where I have to write papers. And someone said, you should take art, and I had never made art, and so I took a course at college. The end of my sophomore year and it was taught by a guy who had gone to Yale and had studied under Albers and the course was Albers color course 
And it was the first time I met people that weren't jocks. And it was the first time, it's like we just would work until one at night solving these color problems. And I started to do, that kind of got me to begin to make art. And, um, but it, it was, it, I never, you know, I was always a little, you know, if something was happening and immediately a friend of mine did that thing that was hip at that time, that always was hard for me. And also my dad as an academic, he would be asked by a, a gallery, could you come in and say that this is a, a Donatello? And he would always say, no, because if I'm getting paid to verify something, no one will believe anything that I write. And uh, so money was a big issue. And so, you know, it. I was just lucky. I got picked up hitchhiking, coming back from Colorado by Keith Saunier and a guy named Dickie Landry who was a sax player for Phil Glass. And, you know, they- Serendipity. <laughs> Chance. I mean, I was really lucky. I have to say, all oh, because I didn't go to art school. I didn't do any of that. But they picked me up and they said, "Where are you going, kid?" And it was in New Jersey. I'd already got all the way from Aspen to New Jersey. And I said, "I'm going to New York. We're going to New York. Hop in." And I get in the back seat, and they're speaking with this weird Frenchy accent, and and um, and they're talking about Leo Castelli. So I'm like, my ears are like this, and. Um, they dropped me, and they said, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going, we're going downtown. Where? Oh, it's below Canal. We're going below Canal. <laughs> anyway, they dropped me off on West Broadway, and as I got out, Dickie Landry turned to me, and he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I need a job. And he said, well, go to the corner of Prince and uh, Worcester. And I was walking to Delancey Street to my place. So I went down, they dropped me off at Prince and West Broadway. I walked down a block and there were all these windows soaked up and it had busboy, waiter, dishwasher. I can do that. So I walked in and this was food that Gordon Mata Clark had started and his girlfriend um, was managing it. She came out, can I help you? And I said, well, can I get a job? And she said, yeah. You want to be assistant chef? <laughs> I had never cooked, right? Wow. And I said, well, what do I have to do? She said, you know how to boil vegetables? Water, yeah. Do you know how to make a salad dressing? Oil, yeah. And so I got hired. But I cooked. When Keith Sonier came up here, he uh, brought Dickie Landry up. And he said, Dickie, I want you to meet somebody. So they went up to the top of this loft, and it was Phil Glass. And Phil played the piano for Dickie. And Dickie said, well, that's really cool, but you need a band. <laughs> and, and Phil said, where do I get a band? And he said, I'll get you one. And he brought all these guys up. Uh, from New Orleans, who were rhythm and blues players and stuff like that. Cool. And they played, and you know, at, at 112 Green Street, where mm -hmm. Mary Heilman showed, I showed, Gordon, all these people had their first shows. Um, Phil would be playing there. No one knew who he was. And there'd be these people, and then the rest of us were all lying on the floor probably most of the room was stoned. And I just could, how do they play such exacting music and be so wrecked? So, I mean, I think, again, that's a testimony to, to the times, you know, where, where these kind of encounters were possible. Um, I want to thank you both for telling us about your practice and your stories. And I want to invite the audience to um, ask questions for the artists. Oh, don't all jump at once. <laughs> Yeah, you did. There's one. Yeah. Nathan. How long did your stand up comedian act last? Uh, that started in about uh, 1980, somewhere in there. <clears throat> I met um, 
uh, actually, I met, uh, what's his name? Can't, yeah. You know, he's the angry guy. Uh, Comedian? Yeah. Uh, no, no. What? Jeff Black? Jeff Black. No, no. Nope. Anyway. No. Okay. Earlier than that. At, 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 um, I'll think of it in a minute. And um, I met a comedian at a friend's house at dinner, and I said, uh, you know, he, I said, you know, I've always had this uh, opportunities and this idea of doing stand-up comedy. And uh, he said, well, I'm running a room. Why don't you come down? And... Uh, uh, and do a do an open mic. I went eh, like that because I had considered going to some comedy clubs, and I kept thinking, you know what? Because people didn't like my work so much in the art world, they're going to come up to me if I'm at least a little bit funny. They're going to come up and they're going to say, "John, I love the comedy." <laughs> you know, that was my fear. Anyway, uh, I, then I decided it wasn't uh, everybody that's asked to do kind of stand-up comedy. <laughs> So I decided, um, I've been thinking about it, I'll do it. And it was this little place on uh, West Broadway called Sylvette's. It was named after the sculpture, the Picasso sculpture. And I, I was practicing. I had a little stick in my studio, and I was writing, and I was practicing. And, and I called Lou, Lou Black. You know who Lou Black is? That's who it was. And Lou, uh, I, I called up Lou and I said, Lou, I don't know, I'm practicing here in my studio and everything is coming out like Henny Youngman. I'm not Henny Youngman. He says, everybody goes through Henny Youngman. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, the reason why you sound like Henny Youngman is because you're nervous and you do that rat-a-tat kind of delivery. I was a lot more like a Midwestern sort of slow delivery guy, you know. Well, anyway. I, uh, I remember hearing you early on. Yeah. And you were really funny. And we got to be friends. Yeah. And I had a place, uh, a farm upstate, and you came up. and um, That was fun. We did walks and cooked and drank a lot. And wow. um, my sister was up there, and we sang to the wee hours of the night at yeah. the top of our voices. But also, you were funny during the whole thing. It's easier to be funny when you're not on stage. <laughs> it's good to know. You always have a fallback career. Um, anyone else have any questions? Yes, in the back. Well... When I built my studio on Shelter Island, um, one of the things, as a sculptor, you have so much crap stored in, and I was paying rent in all these different places. And so I built, a, half the building is underground on Shelter Island so that I could store stuff. And as I was bringing stuff in, I had a milk crate with rocks. And I kind of went, what are these, you know? And, you know, I think if you go to anyone's house out here, they've got rocks, rocks yeah. on their window sills and in their bathroom and whatever. And, um, but these rocks were re like really interesting shapes. And it kind of shocked me. And I had been doing kind of the art historical kind of big commissions all over the country for such a long time. And I was kind of finished with it. And so when I found um, these rocks, uh, and, and for commissions, you have to make a model to sell your idea. And, you know, a model could be this big, and that might be 35 feet tall, and you'd have a figure or something in it. And um, so when I saw these rocks, which were maybe this tall to that tall, I immediately saw them as enormous. And, uh, and at first, I started kind of carving them out of foam, about the same, a little bigger. And I kind of went, you know, what's cool about these is these stones are made by glaciers coming down through Canada, 
down through Vermont, crushing, breaking, tumbling, and then dropped at a moraine. And Long Island is a moraine. And so the ocean side, you don't really see this. But on the bay side, when you walk along, sometimes it's sand, and then sometimes it's all rocks. And I would walk my dog after finding these first stones, and I would stagger back to my truck with all these stones. And, and I began to then, as I say, carve them at first. But I said, you know, this was formed by nature. And if I'm thinking of these stones as really large scale, almost like Paleolithic standing stones in Normandy and Scotland and Ireland, um, nature formed these. So what I did is I began to scan them, make a 3D model of it, and then I could hook that up um, and carve them in foam at 12 feet and do them in bronze. Or uh, for that piece in Florida, uh, I, there was a, a place out in Michigan that, um, that carved architectural columns and facades and things like that. So I contacted them and we carved these stones, you know, so the bottom stone is 16 feet long and the top stone, you know, and when the top stone is on top of it, it's eight feet tall and it was 24 tons. And we got it and stuck it on top of flatbeds, drove it to, Flo to, to uh, Florida and, and installed them at the house. It's interesting how you, how you uh, play with scale, right? Scale and weight. Um, well, the funny thing the is... little stones that get blown up and, and... The, you know, making all these environments, um, really almost the, the 112 Green Street, but also at Holly Solomon, I didn't sell objects because I made environments. And, um, and no one was going to buy a room at that point. And... Um, but because of the environments, and because I had done this piece at, at um, uh, PS1, mm -hmm. when Alana Heiss was on the board for this commission and, and Noguchi turned it down, um, she put my name up and got it, but, and then just one after another. And um, there was a part of me, go, going back to the idea of money, when I grew up in Italy, I'd be sitting in Piazza Navona eating an ice cream. My parents were having a coffee or a wine or something. And there was a Bernini sculpture right in the middle of the thing. On the, if you walked into any church, there were Leonardo da Vinci, you know, there was all this stuff. And art wasn't a commodity. Right. And again, the idea of money kind of freaked me out. And um, so when I got the chance to do public art, I thought, this is great because I'm making environments that people live in. And they may hate it at first, but then within a year or two, they get used to it and then try to take it away. No way. It's the best way to experience art. Hmm? It's the best way to experience art, is public art. Well, I want to thank both artists and thank you for coming tonight. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you.